Let's open our Bibles to Matthew 24. When Jesus tells us through his disciples about the future, he built every word of what he said about the future around one spot on planet Earth. And I want to take you there this morning in your minds because in theological circles, Matthew 24, which we're looking at, Mark 13, which is the parallel chapter that says the same thing, and Luke 21 are all called the Olivet Discourse, which is theological jargon for Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is on the east side of Jerusalem, spreading out higher than the city of Jerusalem, and Jesus was on the side of it looking toward Jerusalem as he said all of these words that we're looking at that we're getting soon to the 15th and 16th verses. Jesus framed his words about the rest of the history of this planet as he looked at Jerusalem and all of its earthly glory at that moment. As we look at Christ's first words, and I want to remind you, look at verse 2 once again. We've gone over and over and over this, but every time... I spend another week looking at it and reading it. Just It just uh, deepens. But look at what he said in verse 2. And Jesus said to them, after they asked him uh, their question, Do you see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, a lot of people have questioned that. And they say, well, wait a minute. I thought that there's the wailing wall. Right? You ever heard someone say, oh, no, there's the wailing wall. Those are still standing. Well, if you back up to verse 1, the context is his disciples came to show him the buildings of the temple, the buildings that surrounded the courtyard. The 20, it's 24 acres, by the way. And those 24 acres of plaza were surrounded by massive buildings. In fact, I just spent the last two weeks taking people on this trip, and everywhere we went to a Greek temple, I told them that this building was either larger or smaller, or in some way I compared it to the temple in Jerusalem, which was one of the most magnificent structures of the ancient world. But did you know not one stone of verse 1, the buildings of the temple, remains to this day? Certainly many stones of the foundation, some of them weigh 570 metric tons. They're still sitting quite solidly. But Jesus said in verse 2, not one stone of what you just asked me about, those buildings that circle the, the temple itself, the 24-acre plaza, not one of them will be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. So Jesus said... When you think about, and that was his introduction to verse 3 and onward, this signs of his coming. And Jesus says, when, when you want to know whether I'm coming, he says, here's your key. Keep your eyes on Jerusalem. I want you to let that sink in your mind, because I'm going to talk to you more about Jerusalem than probably most of you want to hear or even thought about. Jesus said, the key to knowing the future The key to understanding my return, the key to understanding the end of the world is by keeping your eyes on Jerusalem. Watch Jerusalem. As we turn to the subject again of Christ's coming and look at another one of those incredibly detailed snapshots that we're looking at, the the different things that are in place when Jesus returns that we can see coalescing right now before our eyes. I want you to realize that Jesus said that the end of the world surrounds a city. And that city is the most important place on earth to the God of heaven. And I want you to think about that with me this morning. The most mentioned place in the Bible is a city called Jerusalem. The center of the world and the prophetic universe is the very same city. In fact, I've made it my hobby that Jerusalem's my favorite city. When I travel, especially uh, to groups, and there's some gathering of Christians, and they want to have this way to know each other, they usually play these little games, and you fill in the the squares, and what's your favorite food, and your favorite, all this stuff. And it always says, where's your favorite place? And I always put Jerusalem. Well, and, and then I explain it, next to Bonnie, or Jerusalem, preferably together. You know what I mean. Uh, but Jerusalem is my favorite city. It is the city that God chose for himself. Let me just read to you. 1 Kings 11 says this. I will not, Jesus is uh, 
uh, promise that, that, that David, uh, he was the son of David and the throne of David would continue. And that whole promise from the birth of Christ goes back to a promise God made to David. And this is what the Lord said. I will not tear away the whole kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son. This is to Solomon, he's saying, for the sake of my servant David, because of that promise that Jesus would be a son of David and his throne would continue forever. But listen to the end of 1 Corinthians eleven thirteen. God speaks. And for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. Jerusalem's the one spot on earth that God picked and said, that's mine. He says, everything else is just, you know, going, going to destruction. But that is my place. I want that place. Ancient maps, before modern times, always put Jerusalem in the center of the world. I think that was pretty fitting. Jerusalem is God's timepiece. If you look at Jerusalem, you can tell what time it is prophetically. That's what I want to impress on your minds this morning. The final events of world history will culminate there, at that spot. The spot from which Jesus ascended to heaven, in Acts 1, is a spot to which Jesus will descend in glory, Revelation 19. So all of human history surrounds that place called Jerusalem. Jerusalem is mentioned over 800 times by name, actually 814 times. Uh, Zion, a euphemism, another name, a code word for Jerusalem, is mentioned 160 more times. City of David, another description of that is mentioned 46 times so over 1000 times it's the most mentioned place on this planet and god says it's my place jerusalem is a very important place in jerusalem god promised christ's coming as the lamb of god when did he promise that to abraham 2200 bc wow That means 4,000 years ago, God told Abraham, in Jerusalem, the Lamb of God is coming here. This is my place. Then, 800 years later, to Moses, God says, I'm going to set up a place of worship there in Jerusalem. And then to David, he said, this is my place I've chosen. And then through his prophets, he said, this is the place. So what does that mean? Well, Jerusalem has experienced 3,000 years of lifetimes. Abraham and Isaac on the altar of Moriah, a stone's throw from the center of Jerusalem. David, the shepherd king, as he was watching Bathsheba from a distance in that very same city. Jeremiah, as I mentioned to you in our reading this morning, walking around the burning heaps of rubble of the destruction of the first time by Nebuchadnezzar was writing his laments. Peter's betrayal was in the city. Jesus walked the way of sorrow. Here it is that Jesus died with forgiveness on his lips. And here it was that Peter, on the day of Pentecost, shouting to all who would hear that Jesus was risen and that forgiveness was found in his name. But today, all that's left from Christ Jerusalem is the Western Wall. That's all that's left from the Jerusalem of Christ days. It's just the foundation stones. And I thought it was interesting last June when we walked up to that Western Wall Plaza, I found something new. The Jewish government put a 10-foot high sign up, and it's about an arm's width wide, and it's at every entrance to the Western Wall. Now, this is not, this is not the Messianic, you know, Jews for Jesus crowd. And this is not the Hell, Lindsay, Left Behind, La Haye crowd. This is the secular government of the nation of Israel. And I copied it for you because I knew you wanted to know what they said. And this is what it says when you walk into the, the only spot left from the time of Christ. This is what it says. Ten feet high. Quoting. I got every word. Jewish tradition teaches. Jewish tradition. See, they don't believe it anyway, but it's just, you know, it's their background. The secular Jews. Jewish tradition teaches that the Temple Mount is the focal point of creation. In the center of the mountain lies the foundation stone of the world. Isn't that interesting? The Jewish traditions believe that creation, the first stone was set in the Temple Mount. Uh, 
Um, here Adam came into being. Now that's where the Jews and the Catholics agree. The Roman Catholic Church believes that Adam uh, is buried in Jerusalem. The Roman Catholic Church believes Adam, as in Adam and Eve, was buried in Jerusalem and that that is the center of the Garden of Eden and all that. They think it's all around there, so Catholics and Jews agree there. Uh, here Abraham, we agree with this, Isaac and Jacob served God. The first and the second temples were built. This is all the sign that the Jews set up. The first and second temples were built on this spot as Solomon his son accomplished the longings of David and built the first temple 3,000 years ago. It was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, as I told you, Jeremiah witnessed that. The second temple was rebuilt on its ruins 70 years later. It was raised by the Roman legions over 1,900 years ago. And that's what Jesus is talking about right here in verse 2 of chapter 24 of Matthew's gospel. Um, the present western wall, and that's why the sign is there, before you is a remnant of the western temple mount retaining walls. The Jews have prayed in its shadow for hundreds of years, an expression of their faith in the rebuilding of the temple. In the rebuilding. The signs just went up last June. In print, the secular government of the nation of Israel, ten foot high at every entrance to this plaza, wrote, and I'll read it again, Before you stands the shadow of hundreds of years, an expression of the faith in the rebuilding of the temple. They're putting us on notice to want to rebuild that place. And that's what Jesus in this chapter told us that when he comes back to this planet there'll be a temple sitting in Jerusalem where it used to sit. The sign ends with this, sages said about it the divine presence never moves from the western wall and then they conclude their little sign with the temple mount continues to be the focus of the prayers from all over the world. Well why is that? Well, let's go from Matthew to John chapter 4. I want to show you four things this morning before we go I want you to think about them in your hearts. John chapter 4 and verses 20 to 24 needs to remind us of something, and that is that Jerusalem, Jesus left for us to be a lesson to us about God's kingship. Okay? God's kingship. Think about what Jesus tells us, starting in chapter 4 of John's Gospel. Because when you are chosen by God, there's no limit to what all he can do with you. When God picked Jerusalem, it was unknown. And it would have ended up like every other city of the ancient world has ended up. A blip, a pile of rocks, or not even. If it hadn't been that God picked Jerusalem. And the reason he picked Jerusalem, there are four reasons, and John 4 has one of them, and I'm going to show you all four this morning. But it's a lesson. More, I mean, it doesn't matter why geographically. It's probably because it's the hinge of three continents, Africa, uh, Europe, and Asia, and it's the hinge right there. And in the ancient world, because of the layout of the mountains, you had to come down that way to go back up. And, and it was just kind of like the crossroads of the world. And God set his people right in the center, kind of like at the intersection. You can pick the biggest intersection in town. You might take Memorial on 71st and imagine putting someone right in the middle and a lot of people are there and they usually have the same kind of little signs you know if you've noticed them it looks like they're all written by the same person but but if you want to be seen you go and stand at the big intersection well God wanted the Jewish people to represent him in the intersection of the world and he put the Jews right where they are so that all the caravans and all the trade routes and all the armies would have to trample across their land. And God put Jerusalem right in the middle of that to show his kingship. Because when God picks you, there's no limit to what he can do with you. And when God picked Jerusalem, unknown and headed toward what every other vanished city whose ruins dot the globe was headed toward, he said no. You're not going to be like all those cities. You're not going to be like the, the dots of vanished civilizations that people love to go on their vacations to wonder about. He says, no, I put my name on you. And if I put my name on you, you will never vanish. If I put my name on you, you will never cease to exist. If I put my name on you, you have a purpose, you have a future, you have a, you have a great plan from me ahead. So God said, I put my name on you forever forever. 
And what's happened? Well, number one, Jerusalem has become what I like to call the spiritual salvation center of the world. Look at verse 20. Our fathers worship. This is the, the woman Jesus is talking to, the Samaritan woman. Our, our fathers worshiped on this mountain. She's talking about Gerizim. She was up at the well, and she was pointing to Gerizim, um, the mountain of the Samaritans. And you Jews, she looks at Jesus, probably poking a finger at him. You Jews say, Jerusalem is a place one ought to worship. Hmm. So this woman is kind of voicing the popular kind of street knowledge of the day that, that the Jews said that the place to worship God was Jerusalem. So Jesus keeps talking to her and said, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you'll neither worship on this mountain, Gerizim, nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. Verse 22, you worship what you do not know. Now look what he says. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. That was a big statement. He didn't say it was wrong that you worship God in Jerusalem. He said there's a day coming where you won't have to go there to worship. But Jesus acknowledged that Jerusalem was the salvation, spiritual center of the world to this woman. He says, we know what we worship. Salvation is of the Jews, and you're right, Jerusalem is the place. And he set her straight. And you know the rest of the story. The hour is coming, verse 23. And now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And that's where we are right now. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. And I mentioned that to you this morning in my prayer. God wants our worship more than our service. He is seeking that. If you want to know what God's seeking, he's seeking the offering of your undivided heart and attention and spirit upon him. And whatever measure you want to give it to him, he wants that. And he is seeking such to worship him. In verse 24, a profound truth about God. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit. That means regenerated, energized, supernaturally born again. And in truth. That means worship him the way he wants to be worshipped and the way he's revealed himself. Profound truth. Okay, number one, Jerusalem has become the salvation center of the world spiritually. Now, it's fascinating that even to this day that the three uh, monotheistic world religions all hearken back to Jerusalem. Judaism, the Islam, Muslim faith, and Christianity all go back to Jerusalem. It still is a salvation center. It's still a place where God has put his name. And some don't understand and are confused, but it's still that. Uh, turn back to Ezekiel 5.5, 5, because that's not all. That's not the only reason God says keep your eyes on Jerusalem. Ezekiel, that's in the Old Testament. Uh, if you go to the middle, Psalms. Just open your Bible to the middle if you're new at this. Psalms, and then go to the right. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song, Psalm, and Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations. Ezekiel. Go through some big books there. Go to the right. Ezekiel 5. Right at the beginning, in verse 5, listen to what Ezekiel says. And, and by the way, Ezekiel is writing this in exile. Nebuchadnezzar's already come and, and wasted Jerusalem, not completely, but partially, knocked down part of the wall, hauled off people, and he's already taken away their sovereignty, basically. And Ezekiel is a priest who is in exile in Babylon. And look what he writes in chapter 5, verse 5. Secondly, the reason that God says, I am king of the universe and I'll prove it by Jerusalem is this. Secondly, it's the nerve center of the world geographically. This is what the Lord says, verse 5. Thus says the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. I have set her in the midst of the nations and the countries all around her. You see why the cartographers put Jerusalem in the center of the maps? Some of the great learned people of the ancient world were influenced by Judaism. And God said, thus says the Lord God, verse 5, this is Jerusalem. I, the Lord God, have set her, that's Jerusalem, in the midst of the nations, and the countries are all around her. Hmm. The way God looks at this planet is, in fact, uh, I don't want to bore you, but even in the Hebrew language, this shows up. The, the four points of the compass in Hebrew, 
you know what they are? It's as if God is standing, talking in Jerusalem. And it's like he's looking out the eastern gate. And when you say east, it's in front of. And when you say west, it's behind. And when you say north, it's to the left. And when you say south, it's to the right. That's how God orients himself. He orients himself like he's standing on top of Jerusalem looking out the eastern gate. That's how God thinks. He says, I've set Jerusalem in the center of this planet, and, and I put my name on this place. Did you know there's not one reason why Jerusalem is still known on this planet? It's not on a river. It's not a port city. It's not even on a trade route. It's 3,000 feet high on a hill, or 2,600 feet high, and it's kind of away from everywhere. It's out of the way. It's hard to get to, and there's no real reason to go there. There's no good source of anything nearby Jerusalem. The only reason it's still on the map is God said, this is Jerusalem, verse 5, and I've set her in the midst of the nation. Jerusalem is the nerve center of the world geographically. In God's sight, it's the center. It's also the spiritual center as far as salvation goes because that's where the greatest sacrifice of time and eternity was offered, in Jerusalem. That's where Jesus Christ presented himself and taught and his apostles and the day of Pentecost and everything else. But let's back up to Isaiah. That's before this. Go back, back up now, back toward the Psalms to Isaiah in chapter 2. Let me show you the ending. Okay, I always, in fact, I can't believe it, my children are starting to do this. I heard uh, the kids talking in the car and they were reading this new book that they're reading when we drive around and it was getting scary and I don't know, the mice and the shrews and something else. I don't know what all was going on. But one of them turned to the end and read to make sure that their hero made it. And then everyone said, don't tell us. Okay, well, we can turn to the end. Look at Isaiah 2. You're turning to the end. And this is what the scriptures say in Isaiah 2, 1 through 5, that Israel is the glory center of the world Ultimately, the word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. Wow. You know, God sure made a lot of promises. He's going to have a hard time keeping it if Jerusalem doesn't stay around. Do you, do you see what he just said? He said, verse 1, the word Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Jerusalem. Wow. And it says, all the nations, at the end of verse 2, will flow into it. And many people, verse 3, will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares. Why, there's a verse that's even at the United Nations. And they said they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Verse 5, O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. You know what? The glory center of the world ultimately is going to be Jerusalem. And it says here, every nation on this planet is going to be streaming toward Jerusalem. In fact, if you want to know about eight of the hardest chapters in the Bible, read Ezekiel 40 to 48. Ezekiel 40 to 48, the ending of the book of Ezekiel we were just in, is a very graphic description of the temple that God is going to have built after the second coming, after the tribulation, after he takes over this world, and he's going to have this gigantic temple built in Jerusalem. And it says in Ezekiel and Isaiah and Jeremiah that every nation on earth is going to have to come up to kind of it's going to be like mecca or salt lake city or rome depending on what your orientation is religiously it's going to become the place where everyone has to go and to be jerusalem in what we call the millennium and right here is one of the great promises about this city it's going to be the glory center of the world ultimately
And God said, I've staked my name on it. But this is where I want you to get. Now turn to the end of the Old Testament, Zechariah. You go to Matthew and back up, and there's little short Malachi. And then the long book is Zechariah. And I want you to look at chapter 12, okay? So it goes Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. If you remember the walk through the Bible deal we had back in 19, I think, 95, in the old church, they, they taught how you remember uh, the chronology of the books. And they said that... that uh, Ezra, and Nehemiah, Esther, and Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, those three of the historic and the prophetic books are all after the exile. They're all after the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. So we're in that, that time after the exile, after the destruction, and with the rebuilding of the city. And this is what Zechariah says. I love it. Chapter 14. Uh, of the book of Zechariah. This is the last reason why we should keep our eyes on Jerusalem. Number one is the salvation center of the world spiritually, and the nerve center of the world geographically, the glory center of the world ultimately in the future. But, but for our reading the newspaper, Zechariah says it's the storm center of the world prophetically. Now when we used to live on the East Coast, we always watched the hurricane season because as you know florida's been getting them but before that it used to come up further and new england had been hit hard and a lot of death and devastation over the years and so whenever tornado season and what they did is they would watch the weather in africa because that was the storm center the rainfall patterns of africa determines what's going on down where the tornadoes or the hurricanes form and then you would start watching them being lobbed toward the coast well you know what the Bible says the storm center, the place that warns you about what's coming as far as on the prophetic horizon, the storm center prophetically of this planet is Jerusalem. This is what it says in Zechariah 14. I'm going to read the first eight verses. Zechariah 14, behold, the day of the Lord is coming. If you know anything about the Bible, day of the Lord is code word for the end, the second coming, not the rapture. This is all oriented toward the Jews. And so the day of the Lord is when God rescues the Jews and rights all wrongs and Jesus comes back to the earth. So that's called the day of the Lord. It's a time of, of all the way through the prophets, much described. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. That's another way of saying the second coming is coming. And your spoil will be divided in your midst. He's writing to the Jews here. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. Wait a minute, when Zechariah wrote this, it was after the what? It was after the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. When Zechariah wrote these words, there was not a city of Jerusalem. There was nothing but blackened stones. There's nothing but tumbled down walls. There was no temple. There was no city. Uh, Nehemiah had not come and built the wall back. Zerubbabel had not come back, and, and Haggai had not prophesied, and they had not started the temple again. When, Jer or when Zechariah wrote these words, and there is a spot on the Mount of Olives where they say he wrote it. It's a cave. It's a very sobering place to stand in that cave on the east side of Jerusalem and look at that magnificent city and to read this wording and to think when Zechariah wrote these words, there wasn't a city there. Now look what he wrote. Verse 2. I, that's the Lord God Almighty. God says, I'm going to gather all the nations of planet earth against Jerusalem. And I'm sure that Zechariah went, there's nothing out there. Nobody even knows where we are. There are no trade routes that come through here. There, we're not even on the map anymore. And God said, 2,500 years ago, I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city will be taken. So there's going to be a city here again. The houses rifled. The women ravaged. Half the city will go into captivity. But the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Verse 3. Then. So this gives us a little idea of what the climax of the tribulation is going to be like. All the nations are going to come. This is Armageddon stuff. And they are going to march. And Jerusalem is going to fall. And they're going to be ravished is, is another word for saying sexually molested. I mean, it's going to be a horrible thing. There's going to be uh, raping going on. There's going to be murder going on. The Jewish people are going to be in that city. And it says half of the city 
will be taken if, if you read the other uh, sections. And then it says two-thirds. So it's half is taken and two-thirds are, are ravished and killed. But look at this. But the remnant shall not be cut off. And then the Lord will go forth to fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. Now here is the second coming. If you've waited for it, it's verse 4. And in that day, this is Revelation 19 that you see in Revelation, but here is John, or, uh, Zechariah seeing it ahead of time. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. And what have I told you all morning? Which faces Jerusalem on the east. Okay, here's the Mount of Olives. And you look at Jerusalem. And you look in the eastern gate and you see all that. And Jesus, as he's looking at Jerusalem, comes down... And we even know how he comes down. He comes down facing Jerusalem. And it says his feet touch it as he looks at that city. It's just amazing to see the future like this. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making it a very large valley. Half the mountain shall move toward the north, half toward the south. By the way, do you know what's on the back side of the Mount of Olives? Abu Dis the Palestinian headquarters. Okay, sorry, shouldn't have told you that. Um, but it's there, it says it, you know, and, and you shall uh, flee, or toward the south, verse 5, then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Azale, yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah. Thus the Lord my God will come, and all the saints with you. That's us sitting here. We come as spectators in the second coming. That's why in a few weeks when I get to the next section, which is why I believe in the tribulation, why I believe in the rapture, we're going to look at these verses. The Bible always is framed in such a sense that even the first prophecy in the Bible is by Enoch, seventh from Adam, and he says the Lord is coming, the second coming, with, when he comes, already with him, are ten thousands of his saints. We come with him. We come with him and we get to see this deliverance. When he comes to rescue his chosen people in the city that he's placed his name on, look what it says there, and all the saints with you. Verse 6, it shall come to pass on that day that there will be no light. The lights will diminish it shall be one day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at evening time it shall happen that it will be light, and that day it shall be that living water shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea and half of them toward the western sea. So half are going to go to the Dead Sea, half are going to go to the Mediterranean Sea. In both summer and winter it shall occur. Okay, back up to chapter 12 of Zechariah, the same book. Because God has promised at the end of the world, Jerusalem would be like a source of fear and vexation and stress for the whole world. So what leads up to this climactic feat on the Mount of Olives, second coming of Christ, that I just read to you? Zechariah 12. Look at verse 2 of Zechariah 12. Behold, God is speaking, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day, I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. That is another amazing word from God. When those words were spoken 2,500 years ago, Babylon has torn down the city and burned it. Zechariah wrote, As Jerusalem lay in ruins and was surrounded by wilderness, and Jerusalem remained desolate for centuries, and century after century passed, and again it was rebuilt by Herod, and the Romans came and laid siege to it and destroyed it again. And Zechariah's prophecy that I just read to you in verses 2 and 3 of Zechariah 12 seemed like madness. It was one of those things that must mean something other than what it says. I mean, it's not going to happen here. And even after Israel's rebirth in 1948, it didn't seem like it was possible. Yet today, this 
prophecy is exactly as it is foretold. In a world of nearly six billion people, nearly every nation on earth has their eyes on Jerusalem. Why? Because of the Muslim world. Because the Muslims have their third holiest shrine there. And the Jews, last June, started putting up 10 foot high signs that say, We are going to rebuild our temple. I'm not talking about the temple faithful that always have said these wacko things. I'm talking about the nation of Israel, sovereign nation, has put up a 10 foot high sign at every entrance that you have to go through. It says, We're going to rebuild a temple up here. That's why the whole world is fearful that the next world war, if it breaks out, will be fought over that tiny city. That is a fulfillment of prophecy. When Zechariah 12, 2 and 3 was written, Jerusalem, as he looked across from his cave on the Mount of Olives at the burned city with its stones laying down, there was no city, there was no hope for the future, and yet God told him to write that every nation on earth is going to surround that city and try and get it. And he must have said, God, I hope you know what you're saying. I'm writing this down in your book. And it's going to stay forever settled in heaven. Jerusalem is a small city. It has no commercial importance nor strategic. Yet the eyes of the world are on it as no other city. Jerusalem is indeed a burdensome stone around the necks of all nations in the world. It is the most vexing and the most volatile problem that the United Nations faces today. You look at the majority of the stuff going on over there, the majority of their, their edicts that they make, their resolutions or whatever they are, have to do with something with Israel. The majority. Unbelievable. There is no ordinary explanation for this. What the Hebrew prophets declared thousands of years ago, what seemed utterly fantastic and wild in their time, is fulfilled in your and my lifetime. And this is all part of the evidence that the prophesied last days are probably upon our generation. Because another little piece of this puzzle is that God said that Persia, the prince of Persia, is going to be working night and day for the destruction of God's people. Persia in the Bible is Iran of today and the Iranians are building atomic components as fast as they can they've already bought the missiles and developed them to deliver them and they're trying their hardest to put some atomic tipped stuff weaponry on the ends of their missiles just like God said well back to Matthew 24 and we're gonna have to wrap this up Matthew 24 says this Verse 15 is where we've gotten to. This is the snapshot that we're on. Matthew 24 and verse 15 and 16. When Christ returns, the wandering Jews have come back to the promised land. I told you that last week. He says, verse 16, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. For Jesus to say that, there would have to be someone living in Judea. The Roman Empire banished the Jews, said they couldn't come back to Jerusalem. Jesus said, the Jews are going to be living in Jerusalem when I come back. So the Roman Empire has dissipated, but God's word continues. And that's the first thing we see from those two verses. The second thing is, look at verse 15, back up, when you see the abomination which is spoken by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Let him who reads, let him understand. The second thing we see from these two verses is, number one, that the Jews would return, and I went through that completely last time, all the promises and that they've done it. The second thing is that there's going to be a temple there because they're going to be in the holy place. And the way that the word is used is that is the temple. That is the word the Bible uses for the temple. And Jesus saw it there. And if Jesus saw it, I know we're going to see it. When Christ returns, the third temple is built in Jerusalem. And what did Jesus and Daniel and Paul and the Apostle John all have in common? Each of them saw the future temple of God standing in Jerusalem at the end of earth's days. And I told you that last June, those signs showed up. I mean, I've been going to Israel uh, for 20-some 20, 20 years. They just showed up last June. We're going to rebuild our temple one way or another. By the way, how are they ever going to build that temple? Well, 
I told you last time that the Jewish Sanhedrin uh, reconvened on January 20th, 2005. 71 sages following the prescriptions of the ancient Jewish writings. Then on February 9th, just right after their first thing, three weeks later, they began to reinstitute the beginnings of discussions, how you do animal sacrifices. The New Testament tells us that there are animal sacrifices at the temple. They're talking about it. Well, look at, at Matthew twenty four fifteen. Wherefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Just before we go, and this is the last one, turn back to Daniel 9. I want you to see this. This is where we're going to pick up next time. Jesus said, you're going to see something that Daniel saw. Jesus says, you, my, my people, I'm writing this to you to give you hope. I'm writing this to show you I keep my word. And if you see these things happen, you ought to be very filled with hope. Look at what Daniel 9, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos. So if you just back up from Matthew, you'll find it's the biggest book uh, back from Matthew there before the big prophets. Daniel 9, and starting in verse 26. After 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. That's the substitutionary atonement. That's Jesus dying not for himself, but for the sin of the world. So there's Daniel um, looking forward to the substitutionary atonement of Christ. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Who destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70? The Romans. Now look at how they're described as the people of the prince who is to come. That's where we get the revived Roman Empire. I just taught that this week in school. The Roman Empire was never destroyed. It just dissipated. The Roman Empire is still in place. And every piece of it has had their day in the sun. Have you ever thought about that? England, the sun never set. That was part of the Roman Empire. The Spanish armada that, that ruled the seas, they had their day in the sun. The French and Napoleon had their day in the sun. The Germans twice had their day in the sun. The Italians had their day, especially uh, through the, the working with Hitler and all that. And even other parts of the Roman Empire have had their day in the sun. The Roman Empire's never died. It's just shuffled around a bit. But it's back. I mean, on this trip, we were spending the same money across Europe. Europe is united economically. They're starting to get united legally. And as soon as they get united militarily, it's going to be awesome. Because Rome will be back. And who knows all that. I mean, it's interesting. We'll get into that later, what's going on with the ten and all that. But look what it says in, in the next verse, in verse 27. Then he, that's this leader of this people of Rome that have come back, the revived Roman Empire, which could be united Europe. Then he, this, this president of Europe or whatever uh, he might be, will confirm a covenant, that is a peace treaty, with many for one week. That's what we call the one week, the tribulation, seven years. And it starts out with peace. What the world's always wanted, peace. And this leader's going to rise up and he's going to promise peace. To the world and he's going to probably have the power and the finances and whatever to do it in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate doesn't that sound like what Jesus just said in Matthew 24 15 and 16 he says when you see the abomination that causes desolation in the holy place what is he doing in the holy place he said as Daniel said Daniel 927. He brings an end to the animal sacrifices and offerings that the Jews are offering in Jerusalem in this temple that Jesus said they're going to build that just last June they put up the sign and declared it finally once and for all publicly. They're going to do it. And that's all happening in our lifetime. And Jesus said, when you see those things happening, lift up your heads because I'm coming. And guess what? If Jesus is coming... For that, he comes for us before. Now let me ask you this. Is there anything that you're doing today that you would not want to be doing when Jesus comes? Then he says you shouldn't do it. Is there anything you aren't doing today that you wish you could do before you go to heaven? 
then Jesus says that's what you're supposed to do. And that's what the church was supposed to be engaged with because we never know when he's coming. Because he doesn't have to come just before the abomination that causes desolation. He just says that when that's there, I'm coming. That's why Paul thought he was coming in his time, and that motivated him. And that's why Peter was faithful to the end, and it motivated him because he was looking for Christ's return. And that's why the first century church was looking for Christ and standing in the arena and living in the catacombs and gladly taken the spoiling of their goods, as Hebrews 11 says, because they looked for him to come. We're the first generation of the church that's not excited about Christ's coming. Do you know why? We feel like we're in heaven now. It's so nice. And that's why the Lord, probably on this Christian nation, is going to bring great trouble so that the real Christians here will get back to looking forward to Christ's coming. Let's bow before the one who's coming and tell him we want to be ready. Father in heaven, I thank you for these snapshots that Jesus gives us. Thank you for how it ties the whole Bible together. It thrills my heart to see all the components prepared centuries ago by your prophets that Jesus alludes to and that we're seeing before our very eyes this morning. And Lord, as John said, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. May we say with him, let me not be ashamed before you at your coming. I pray that your spirit would, would take the scalpel and, and cut in our hearts and point out the areas that are treasures to us that deflect our love from you, our attention from you, the anxious thoughts, whether they be for the future, whether they be for our problems or our health or our finances, that keep us from worshiping you more frequently, more fully, more completely. And Lord, I pray for any who don't even yet know you, so you're not coming for them. I pray that today that they would feel the stirrings of your spirit and that you would draw them to yourself. Draw us closer that we can live expectantly for your return. Tonight as we come to your table and as we look at how on this very passage, the Apostle Paul taught the Thessalonians how they could live every day really looking for your coming. As we get ready for your table and get ready for your coming, help us to live that way. And so we commit ourselves to you until you come or call. And for any that don't know you, I pray today they might seek you, whom to know is life eternal. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.